Hello viewers, I hope you are doing well, having a good day and keeping your hands clean. Welcome to Afropolitical TV. This topic was suggested by members of my Facebook group following my video on Patrice Lumumba. So I hope you learn a thing or two by the end of this video. Mobutu's trademark leopard print hat helped establish him as a cultural icon in Africa during the Cold War. But what lies behind the leopard print and wooden canes is a man who was hell-bent on demanding respect and hoarding wealth from Congolese people. So much so that during his reign he changed the name of the country from Congo to Zaire and caused the demise of Congo as a nation. Initially, before assuming power, Mobutu worked closely with Patrice Lumumba towards the independence of Congo from Belgium. He joined the Congolese National Movement which was headed by Lumumba and even represented him in Brussels Roundtable Conference on Congo's independence. Also, when Congo became independent, Mobutu was appointed as the Secretary of State for National Defence by Lumumba. Now this appointment put Mobutu in a key position that determined the events leading up to Lumumba's death. This is because he was the head of the army and in the event of a revolt, he can decide where the army's loyalties lie. So let's break this down. At the time of independence, there were two centers of power, Kasavubu, who was appointed president, and Lumumba, who was appointed prime minister. Now these two figures were significantly different in that Lumumba advocated for a centralised government whereas differently Kasavubu wanted a more federalised form of governance where regions would be devolved power. Mobutu however opted to support Kasavubu's dismissal of Lumumba. I can't find the reason why he decided to do this but if I do I will place it in the description box for you to have a look. Alternatively, if you are familiar with this story, please feel free to drop a comment down below. So Mobutu gained control of the government, handed power over to Kasavubu and Lumumba was flown to Katanga where he was killed, allegedly. All the while, Mutubu maintained control of the army. But, five years later, in 1965, Mobutu led a coup to oust Kasavubu and became president of Congo. Now, I must add that there are others who played a role in these events, such as Moise Shombe, I think that's how you pronounce his name, who was premier at the time in Katanga. But I know you like how concise my videos are, so again, you can read up on these stories in depth using my link in the description box below. I will also include um, all the sources where I got my videos from, there are loads of documentary so you are free to watch those after this video. Now, Mobutuism was outlined in 1967 within the Manifesto of Nsele, that being the Manifesto of Mobutu's political party. Three of the main themes of this manifesto were nationalism, revolution and authenticity, or as they like to say, authenticité. Nationalism being the achievement of economic and political independence, revolution, the repudiation of both capitalism and communism and authenticité, which is the doctrine of authentic Zarian nationalism and condemnation of regionalism and tribalism. Ooh. In many ways, Mobutu aimed to achieve the themes outlined in his manifesto. In the five years leading up to the country's name change, Mobutu was able to position himself as an authoritarian figure in the DRC. He rejected the title of politician and rendered his parliament useless, 
by announcing that there would be no political activity for five years. He reduced the number of provinces and redirected all autonomy to himself. Eventually, Mobutu became the new Congolese ideology. In 1970, Congo held a presidential election, but only one party was allowed to run. Mobutu's party, the Popular Movement of Revolution, won 98.33% of the vote, which meant Mobutu would be the leader for the next seven years. Obviously, this election was a farce because the constitution at the time asked for at least two parties to contest in the election. Between 1971 and 1997, the DRC was recognised as Zaire as Mobutu aims to rid the country of colonial influences. He even renamed himself, abandoning his birth name, Joseph Desiree Mobutu, for Mobutu Sese Seko Koko Mbendu Wazabanga. <laughs> now, according to the Encyclopedia Britannica, this name means, and I quote, the all-powerful warrior who, because of his endurance and inflexible will to win, will go from conquest to conquest, leaving fire in his wake. <laughs> I mean, when someone has a name like this, there's no joking about. He renamed cities with Belgian names like Leopoldville. Leopoldville became Kinshasa and Stanleyville became Kisangani and Katanga became the Shaba region. He even imprisoned citizens who didn't have African names. All this in an attempt to Africanize the country. In 1974, the Zarian constitution was revised in order to radicalize the revolution and build national spirit as there were over 200 different ethnic groups in the country. Mobutu would no longer be referred to as His Excellency, but instead Citizen Mobutu. Christmas would be celebrated on June 24th and not the 25th of December to re-emphasise the idea that Zaire was not fundamentally Christian, as less than half of the nation were actually Christian. In addition, they declared that Zarian people would cease to speak Belgian French and speak French as it is spoken in France. The Zaire was introduced to replace the franc currency and Air Congo was renamed Air Zaire. Now here on Afropolitical TV we love a Pan-Africanist but Mobutu would prove to be solely self-aggrandizing which would be to the detriment of Congo. Though in theory, Mobutuism sounds forward-thinking and quite similar to what Lumumba was trying to achieve. He routinely made a spectacle of his political rivals by having them tortured, killed and displayed in public hangings. He often reshuffled parliament when it was reinstated in order to prevent any threat to his rule and would use bribery and torture hand in hand to obtain loyalty from high-ranking officials. He was the most corrupt leader of an African nation during his time in office. In 1983, Mobutu elevated himself to marshal of the country. His nepotism and greed was the downfall of Congo's ability to properly benefit and advance from their vast natural resources. He nationalised all of Congo's foreign assets so he could benefit financially but did not have the business acumen to run them successfully. In the face of economic ruin, he had to hand over the assets he had acquired to their previous owners. But then, the price of copper, one of Zaire's major exports, fell drastically and Mobutu turned to the US for help. President Mobutu and I have had the opportunity to review and renew one of our oldest and most solid friendships in Africa, that between the United States and the Republic of Zaire. Cooperation between the United States and Zaire under President Mobutu's leadership stretches back through 20 years and five United States administrations. In that time, American leaders have learned to place a particularly high value 
on President Mobuto's insights and counsel. President Mobuto has brought a consistent voice of good sense and goodwill to the international councils where African issues are considered. From the United Nations, to the Organization of African Unity, to the non-aligned movement. He has stood uniformly for the peaceful settlements of disputes, but has not shrunk from his responsibilities when action was appropriate. In 1983, for example, he dispatched troops to assist Chad in defending itself against Libya's criminal aggression. This year, he came to the assistance of the government of Togo as it faced an externally mounted coup attempt. Much of our discussion today focused on Zaire's her heroic effort to complete its program of economic policy reform. As you know, Zaire has been engaged for nearly four years in a series of painful sacrifices and adjustments designed to rationalize and revive its economy and to develop the potential of its private sector. We have tried to help by supplementing our regular development assistance with special funds earmarked for African states who are undertaking serious steps toward reform. We've also encouraged our business community to look at the growing investment opportunities in Zaire and will continue to do so. Unfortunately, Zaire's determined economic efforts have been greatly complicated by the severe drop in world market prices for its exports. President Mobutu and his people face a heavy foreign debt burden. We have encouraged Zaire to hold firm to the responsible economic reforms it is attempting while promising to do our best to ease the way. Unfortunately for him, he will not be able to rely on this relationship with the US for too long. Now, prior to this relationship with Reagan, Mobutu did not have a good track record with the US. If it wasn't his trips to China or North Korea, then it was his human rights abuses or Mobutu accusing the CIA of having a hand in an attempt to overthrow him. But remember, Mobutu did collaborate with the CIA to have Lumumba removed from office, so his relationship with the US was not new, rather tumultuous. Despite his relations with China, Zaire still continued to receive aid from the US, and this relationship continued on because he covertly supported the US's anti-communist campaign during the Cold War. So the relationship was mutually beneficial. But once the Soviets were defeated, the US no longer needed Zaire as the spread of communism was no longer a threat. His lacklustre attempts to democratise his governance and end kleptocracy came to nothing. And so the facade of the marshal began to crack. According to an article by The Guardian, Mobutu's looted wealth amassed between 5 to $15 billion over his 31 years in office. He bought homes in Morocco, Sweden and France, while many of his citizens lived in fear and did not have access to basic amenities. But just like many before him and after him, you soon realise that you cannot rule forever. Zaire shares a border with the much smaller nation, Rwanda. In 1994, during the Rwandan genocide, millions of Rwandan refugees fled to Zaire. According to the UN, approximately 7% of those refugees were Hutu perpetrators of the genocide. Mobutu opted to show support for the Hutus by ordering Tutsi victims to leave Zaire or face the death penalty. Also, many defeated Hutu military men and political leaders had fled to Zaire and continued to persecute Tutsis, which angered RPF army leader Paul Kagame. Kagame, President Museveni of Uganda and Zarian rebel leader Laurent Kibile joined forces to take over Zaire, much to Mobutu's disbelief. 
he no longer had the support of the French or Americans as again they no longer required his loyalty because international politics had recently seen a shift. As a result, in 1997, Mobutu fled to Togo in exile, then later to Morocco, where he would die of prostate cancer some months later. So this was the end of Mobutu's dictatorship, thanks to Ugandan, Rwandan and rebel Zarian forces. But it would not end the woes of the citizens of Zaire, which was renamed Democratic Republic of Congo. Things have not changed for the better, as they have had two successive presidents since Mobutu. Sawa mi hapa niko na risasi. Hii mkono yangu sitaenda rimia mtoto yangu. Nilipigwa risasi sikukwenda gombana. Sikwenda fanya nini? Mimi niko na watoto yangu, niko na waitima mbili. Eh na mtoto yangu tu mmoja, bawili. I mean, Mobutu really left me confused. On one hand, he was a nationalist, pro-African and anti-colonialist, but on the other, a Western sympathizer, greedy and a narcissist. Some people still love Mobutu and will always refer to him as the Marshal and the DRC's best president. But it's hard to agree when you see how the nation declined when he ascended into presidential power. Roads were not maintained, postal services collapsed, hospitals were well understaffed and citizens were living in constant fear. He was an interesting man and this has been an interesting story but he did not deliver that which was promised to the people of the DRC. So first and foremost, thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you are just as intrigued as I am. I want to know more about African stories because there really are so many. Uh, I wouldn't say there are good ones and bad ones because nothing in, in this world is black and white, but all of them are just as interesting as the next. So if you would like to learn more, please subscribe to my channel if you're watching on YouTube or like my page if you are on Facebook. I'm open to video suggestions, so please don't hesitate to comment below and I will see you in the next video. Bye!